Welcome back, space explorers, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today we're taking another look at Starfield, but unlike the last tour, we're not confining ourselves to New Atlantis on the planet Jemison. Our scope is broadening out to the whole galaxy. There are over a thousand planets across a hundred plus star systems. Think about how much is hiding out there, just waiting to be discovered. But outside of the secrets lurking in the shadows, what's laid bare in the open? What is the vast majority of a planet like? Well, the aesthetics can vary wildly between them. There are some that are like what we are familiar with. Landscapes similar to that, but with an alien twist. Planets with striking color palettes. Most planets really go for their own little unique feel. Let's look at the frozen dunes of Procyon 6C. The simple, plain white aesthetic really stuck with me. Almost everything you can look at, save for the landmarks and occasional rock, is pure white. This feels properly alien, like something you could never find on Earth. The closest we have for comparison is our moon, but it's not quite the same. Comparing it to our moon as it exists in Starfield, there's a lot more gray in the terrain. There's also an atmosphere on Procyon 6C. That's the weirdest part for me. Like this definitely evokes moon vibes, but we're so used to seeing the landscape of the moon in pictures with the sky being black. That's because the moon lacks an atmosphere to scatter the sun's rays and give it color, so we're just seeing the void of space from the surface. On this planet though, the sky has a color, like Earth. The weird combination of the moon-like landscape mixed with the Earth-like sky creates a memorable place for me. I was also struck by Altair 4C. This is another place with a defining color, green. Well, I thought it was green at first, but the human eye and colors have a complicated relationship. This is more of a beige. Which makes sense, considering this is a sandy desert. But it does have a little bit of a green tint, more than I'm used to seeing for desert sands. I was confronted with the game's use of empty space here. Compared to a game like Skyrim, Starfield's worlds are a lot less dense. Yeah, they have points of interest here and there like Skyrim, but with this game, Bethesda isn't afraid to let you walk for a bit with nothing to do or look at. Just hold forward. Like look at this clearing. This is the most sparsely decorated place I've ever seen in a modern Bethesda game. You really feel the scale as you're walking through barren areas. And honestly, the whole planet isn't like this. Just off to the right here are some rocks that add a little bit of variety to the landscape. And to the left we got… hold on, is that what I think it is? Walking… Still walking… This is what I was telling you about. There's a lot of this in Starfield. Finally, an ocean. There is an ocean you're likely to come across during your playthrough, but this is the first coast I've stumbled upon. And I didn't even really stumble upon this. I had to go looking for it. It is extremely rare to find natural bodies of water in this game, which makes moments like this memorable. Look at how far out it stretches. This is a fully simulated planet. You can see going southwards, the land eventually loops back around. Well, I may have misled you a bit there. You can fast travel to any point on this planet, but you can't walk it all in one seamless line. Eventually, you hit a border that stops you from going any further. With that, it's hard to tell just how much of a planet is mapped out. Like is this impassable wall the same impassable wall of another playable chunk? I don't know. Honestly, I don't think it matters that much. Like yeah, 
It's kind of annoying to have this immersion breaking menu come up and tell you to turn around, but I never encountered one of these during my playthrough, and most people probably won't. It'll take you a long time to walk this far when you could just fast travel to wherever you need to go. Even considering that, planets still feel huge in Starfield, so much bigger than any environment in another modern Bethesda game, even if a lot of it is just empty space. Enough of the terrain itself, let's look at some good old spots. On Denebola 1B, you come across a building labeled Lair of the Mantis. Ominous. Does this look like a lair to you? This looks more like a McDonald's production facility. Look, there's the tanks of pink goop they make into nuggets. And yeah, McDonald's says on their website that they don't contain pink slime, but they're pulling the wool over your eyes. I found the pink goop tanks. Unfortunately, it's clogged up, so we'll just go inside. It's really grungy in here. There's a lot of corpses strewn about. You're led deeper and deeper into the facility. Eventually, you come across spacers, but they're no match for the player character. Who is, really? This is definitely a trap. A lot of letters here. Uh, can any of you guys read? Ah, you know what, we'll just go around. Robots guard the lower levels. Fighting through them, you're led into a... Wow. I guess the game wasn't lying. This is a lair. Hell, this is a full-on bat cave. It's here that you learn about the Mantis. The Mantis is a vigilante feared by violent spacers all across the settled systems. This is her home base, and she basically set up the whole path leading into here as a gauntlet to test her son to become the new Mantis. Though I don't see either of them here, and I'm here now. This truly was someone's living quarters. Look at this room. This could almost pass as an apartment in some big city. This room, not so much. She has the workout station here, but also all these tanks and canisters. What even is this little workstation? I have no idea what this is supposed to be. And I just want to reiterate, this is a bat cave. I can imagine a Batmobile up here. And I'm pretty sure I've seen Batman with this exact computer setup. I never would have expected to explore a Batman-esque cave in a Bethesda game, but here we are. Who knows how many cool little places like this there are to discover across the game's many planets. Wait, do you think the Mantis' diet is exclusively McNugget goop? I bet it is. Tolomon II is home to Londinian, a city that had a big space deathclaw problem in the past. To save all the people in the city, the United Colonies evacuated everyone. Once all human life was off-planet, they bombed the spaceport. That way, the creatures can't escape. Problem solved. Uh, hold on. Let me look at that again. Yeah, I think I mixed up the order of things in my script. The UC bombed the spaceport first, forcing Londinian's inhabitants into a cage match with the hulking, murderous Space Death Claws. That way, the creatures can't escape. Problem solved. Yippee! You know what? I think this is the biggest city in the game. Even New Atlantis seems small by comparison. Look at how spread out this is. I wish that city was the size of this place. Just, you know, a smidge less cold. There's a somber feeling walking around here. Everyone was killed by the terror morphs, and then the city was taken over by snow. I'm guessing it was still a snowy planet before everyone died, so they presumably kept everything warm, somehow. 
Walking up here, it's weird to think about how we're not at the ground level for the city. It feels like we're super high up. I can imagine digging down 10 stories or more and eventually hitting the street. You'd find sidewalks, benches, street lamps, all that good stuff. But uh, there's some street lamps at the very top of the snow. So this was walkable at some point in the past. Maybe it was a street, or maybe it was some stairs going up. I don't know. What's the elevation supposed to be like over here? Because the snow dips down and back up, giving no hint as to the flatness of the terrain below. On the other side of the city, it makes even less sense. There's snow piled almost to the roofs of some buildings. As we close out this section, just look at these landscapes and try to imagine where the ground level would be where people would actually enter these nearly buried buildings. What did this city look like 20 to 30 years ago? Neon is one of Starfield's big cities. And this one isn't covered in snow, so we can explore it. This is the place I was alluding to earlier, the only large body of water I saw in the game for a very long time. And it leaves a mark. The city of Neon is located entirely on top of a fishing platform in the middle of the ocean. All around you, 360 degrees, water stretches out to the horizon. It's one thing to be standing on the shore, looking out at a vast ocean wondering how much empty space lies before you. It's another to be smack dab in the middle of that empty space. You know what? Before we go inside, let's jump off the platform. The player character can swim, so we'll be fine. Not convinced you'd actually survive the G's of that, but whatever. We're down here now. The scale is impressive both of the ocean and of the fishing platform towering above you. The pillars are not only tall, but girthy too. They have to be to support such a structure. As for the water, you can just swim. You could swim out to the chunk border. I'm not going to do that. You can imagine what it looks like. If you thought planets were boring in Starfield, have fun staring at a literal flat plane for 30 minutes. You didn't come here to see this. You want to see the city and all its little nooks and crannies. Alright, let's peep it. Oh yeah, this is the capital F future. I haven't played Cyberpunk 2077, but I feel like I have just by exploring this city. It's cool that Starfield has the optimistic and hopeful future city with New Atlantis, and the dingy, brain rot future city with Neon. Where do we even start? Walking in here for the first time, I was overwhelmed by all the signs vying for your attention. Let's start with the Volai Hotel. The lobby feels appropriately big. After all, it's but a hop, skip, and a jump from the main entrance. I bet they see a lot of traffic through here. A lot of booked rooms. Let's go look at them. Huh. Only two floors. That's weird. Would have expected more. I bet there's a lot of rooms on those floors, though. Only one room on the second floor. Same for the third as well. Look, I know Bethesda might not want to model out ten different rooms for each floor to make it seem super realistic, but come on, at least have a bunch of inaccessible doors. We looked at some apartments in New Atlantis last video that did exactly that. This completely breaks the illusion that this is a real hotel in a real world. As much as I hate to say it, I think that's a consistent problem in Starfield. Let's visit the Trade Tower, a structure home to the corporate offices of many different companies. Core Kinetics is a gun shop and range. That's pretty cool. Upstairs you can find their office and wow, this is tiny. I guess I don't know the scale of Core Kinetics as an operation. Maybe they are just this tiny shop and range, and that's it. Sure, I'll give Bethesda the benefit of the doubt on that. 
five desks could be enough for them. Stroud Eklund, Corporate HQ, I'm less forgiving of. You know, THE Stroud Eklund? One of the biggest ship manufacturers in the settled systems? One desk for reception, three desks for research and development of a massive ship manufacturer, oh, and one desk in the executive offices room. And yes, I said executive offices. It says right there on the plaque. This room is the offices. And for the cherry on top, Issa Eklund, you know, of Stroud Eklund fame, doesn't even have an office. The singular executive offices is claimed by generic executive woman. This is bizarre, right? I know a corporate office doesn't do the manufacturing themselves, so they won't need like a thousand desks, but come on, only five for the entire corporate HQ? Kelt Corp, a business that deals in mining technology, has six desks, and a meeting room, and this isn't even their corporate HQ, this is just the regional office. <sighs> Look, if you've seen a lot of these tours, you know I don't bring these up to disparage the developers. I'm not going to call them lazy for making such small offices. In fact, they did a great job detailing what they did create. I love the aesthetic of the Keltcorp office. The alternating pattern on the rug, the wall designs, the paintings. It's so cool in here. But it is small. These offices are like this because the developers prioritized other parts of the game. There are so many more places the player will visit before they walk into the Keltcorp office. And the main story does bring you to the Stroud Eklund HQ, but you aren't asked to go into the back hallways. You could have this mental image that there's a dozen rooms through that passageway, but you never actually go back there to confirm it. Even if you do go back there, who cares? You might not have even noticed anything off if I didn't point it out to you. I'm only talking about this because it kind of defines the game in a way. Like I said, this is a problem throughout Starfield, not just Neon. So many stores, offices, and buildings serve their purpose on the surface, but once you stare at them long enough, the facade fades away. Uh, to kind of balance out the vibes of the video, let's talk about something I think Bethesda did really well. Neon Tactical. It's not really a shop that sticks out visually, but the writing makes it memorable. It's run by a guy named Frank, and he has a combat robot named Styx. Frank is a guy that doesn't really get along with people well, so he spends most of the day talking to Styx. He tells you that he talks to Styx a lot, and I don't know about you, but I didn't really see that as a huge deal. Styx doesn't really have a thinking brain, so he only responds to a few commands. So when I heard he talked to him, and how people thought he was crazy, I imagine it was just how someone talks to their pet, saying stuff like, oh, rough day, or good boy, I, I don't know, something short and inconsequential like that. But this is how the conversations usually go. You ever get nightmares, Sticks, about the war? I'm sorry, I did not understand your query. Please rephrase. I get what you're saying. You just want to forget, but... One's got nothing to do with it. I'm sorry, I did not understand your query. Please rephrase. No one understands, you stupid piece of tin. And that's the problem. It's like if Han Solo talked to Chewbacca, but didn't actually understand what he was saying. That's a fun little dynamic this place has. I can imagine hanging out in here, shooting the shit, waiting for a customer to come by. It's so chill. Last spot in Neon, the Astral Lounge. Does YouTube compression eat this up? I feel like it might. If you've been here in-game, you know how visually stunning this place is without the awful YouTube bitrate. It's dark, but you can still make out a lot of the details. It's almost an assault on the eyes. This is a full-on cyberpunk-esque future. At the bar up here, you can actually recruit people for your crew. I just learned that. This guy's having a good time. As well as these dancers. They're dripped out of their mind.
let's do some places rapid fire before we visit our last major location. We're actually heading back to New Atlantis real quick. I only noticed this after putting out the last video. There's an elevator in the mast lobby that can take you to different levels of the incredibly tall mast tower. But, uh, the elevator isn't lined up with the towery bit of the tower. And one of the stops in the elevator brings you to the NAT station below the lobby. But the elevator lets you off at the side. It doesn't line up there either. Bizarre. I came across this outpost on Bessel 3B. It seemed relatively normal at first, until I jumped the fence. Dozens of xenogrubs, probably over a hundred, just wriggling and writhing about. They won't hurt you, but man, that's gross. I looted what boxes I could and got out of there ASAP. Actually, there's some tanks here. Do you think McNuggets are made from xenogrub? Food for thought. I stumbled into this cave on Kumasi 6. Caves are in no short supply in Starfield, but not a lot of them look like this. Blue crystals emitting a radiant glow, drowning out almost all the darkness you usually find in caves. There's honestly not much of anything in here. The only reason I found it is because I was looking for the last resource node on the planet, and this place basically just houses that element. This caught me off guard when I first discovered it, and it got me wondering. How many beautiful points of interest are out there? Because I'm sure there's like a hundred caves exactly like this across Starfield, probably even way more than that. But how many other generic cave types are there left to discover? I doubt I'll ever see them all. Our last pit stop before dessert is the retrofitted space station. Some quest brings you here, I don't remember which, it doesn't matter. What I specifically found interesting about this station is that it has a little gap in the panels here, leading into the vast nothingness of space. But you can walk around without a spacesuit in here. The spacers you fight on your way here are wearing spacesuits, but you don't have to. And some friendly NPCs you talk to aren't wearing anything. It makes me think there was some disconnect between people working on the game. Like someone deliberately shifted this panel a bit to the side, completely opening up the space station to the vacuum of space, and didn't tell anyone to set the flag so you need a spacesuit in here. I almost wonder if it was a last minute decision, because if you look at it from this side, you can see that the back side of this panel isn't textured, you see right through it. Again, I don't want to make a huge deal out of this. In a game this size, you're bound to have little errors like that. It's just the silly little thing I noticed. Anything else in here? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I almost made it through two videos on Starfield's environments without talking about the control panels. I love to look at keyboards and operating systems when I can in games, and I genuinely think Starfield has some of the best. The buttons are so well modeled and textured, I can just imagine the feeling of typing on this keyboard myself. Knobs, switches, a trackball? Seriously? How cool is that? And what do any of these do? I haven't the slightest idea. How deep did the developers think this out? Was there any internal consistency as to what goes where for panels like this? Or were they just greebling it up, throwing abbreviated nonsense all over the place? Come on, why are these buttons here? This looks like something you'd see in a mobile application, not a space station control panel. But maybe it makes sense in world, I have no idea. And these screens, ugh, it's just pure bliss. Something that this game goes above and beyond with these is that the text is legible. In most games with fake UIs, the screen is such a low resolution you can't make out any of the on-screen information but you can read every character on these screens. I could stare at these all day, just looking at the visual design and soaking it all in. In a way, it reminds me of traditional art pieces, because an artist created these, right? They wanted to evoke a feeling when you see these screens. And just a heads up, I'm not an art guy. I'm just basing what I'm about to say off some hastily done Google searches. After looking into some of the different movements out there, 
I feel like this has its roots in suprematism. Suprematism was a movement defined by simple shapes and their interactions. There's a lot of that in fake UI like this. There's so many boxes with text in them connected in such interesting ways. And there's almost always kind of a hierarchy where some groups of boxes dominate the screen more than others. If there are any art people in my audience and you feel a particular way about what I'm getting at, drop something in the comments. Does this whole train of thought make sense? I feel like I'm staring at an art piece when I look at screens like this. I also feel like I'm having a mental break trying to explain it, but I think you get the gist. Whoever did the work on the fake screens and buttons for this game, they did a great job. Alright, final spot of the video. And you know what? This isn't even a super well-hidden spot. In fact, it's somewhere you might have went within the first couple hours of the game. Earth. It's sad, seeing everything we know reduced to an uninhabitable desert. I mean, it makes sense from a designer's perspective. How would you recreate Earth if it wasn't like this? Would they model out the entire Earth with every little city and town in existence? Obviously not so they'd have to pick and choose which cities to include, but then they have to make it believable. They can skimp on making some office buildings not as believable, but the entirety of planet Earth? You know, the one planet of a thousand in the game you and I actually live on? It's unfeasible to portray a habitable Earth in-game, even if you were to take creative liberties. It just wouldn't feel right. So they concocted a story where Earth becomes unlivable for humans. People leave to settle in other systems across the galaxy, and Earth is left to decay. But there are still remnants from the past. You can find a dozen or so landmarks from present day dotted around Earth. You can find the Shard in London, as well as the Empire State Building in New York, among others. It makes sense that buildings as tall and as structurally sound as these would survive this long. It gets me thinking. Remember Londinian? How I questioned how far up the snow was piled from ground level? Is there old earth infrastructure beneath all these sand dunes? The shard in real life is around a thousand feet tall. How much of that are we seeing here? That's definitely not the full 1,000 foot tower. I haven't been to any of the real-life versions of these landmarks, but I imagine for someone that has, it'd be bizarre to walk around on the sand dunes here, thinking about the streets below that you're familiar with today. Those streets might look a little different considering the time jump from today to when people leave Earth, but there's a lot that'd be the same. Think of all the cool stuff you'd find if you went excavating here. But nobody seems to care about that. Once humanity left Earth, nobody thought to return for any reason. I feel a deep sense of melancholy with that. Humanity moved on and branched out to explore the stars, while little old Earth is left in the dust. What's your favorite location in Starfield? Drop in the comments, I'm curious what you guys discovered. No promises, but I might feature it in a future video. And check out either of these videos if they interest you. Thanks for watching and see you next time.